The video you're about to watch deals with sensitive topics that YouTube might deem not advertiser friendly. Consider supporting my Patreon and fight the gamer oppression today. The Russian movie Brat, directed by Alexei Balabanov and released in 1997, has not only become a cult classic in Russia and other post-Soviet countries, but also had major influence on Western media. The movie and its sequel had massive influence on the storyline and characters of Grand Theft Auto 4, and the movie is now also sparking interest within a lot of Westerners, especially those that are interested in learning about Russia and its history. People loved my original Brat review and have been literally begging me to make a review of the sequel, and it's clear to see why. Brat is a very unique movie. It's categorized as a comedy on Rotten Tomatoes for some reason, but it's actually far from that. Although sometimes very funny, the movie is a gritty drama and a great authentic depiction of life in the late 90s in Russia. A country ridden with poverty, crime, gangs, and also a nation in which people are trying very hard to deal with the sudden influx of capitalism, western culture, and media. Now, I've had massive issues with copyright on my original Brat movie review, when despite me altering the video footage massively, and even speeding and chopping it up, the video still got claimed and blocked worldwide for days on end multiple times by CTB Film Company, uh, which probably stands for cock and ball torture. Not like it's completely illegal to use this footage because it's fair use anyway, but uh, I guess nobody really cares about laws on this website. And yes, if you guys don't know, the reason why the whole movie is gonna be mirrored in this review is also because of copyright. I would really be grateful if you guys would support my Patreon because services like that help us create us a lot with issues like this. Anyway, let's get on with it. Brat 2, released in the year 2000s, is a very different movie compared to the original. Although discussing many similar themes and ideas, the sequel delves into a lot of other topics that were not touched in the original. The majority of Brat 2 takes place in the United States, Chicago and New York in particular, and the topics are very fitting to said country. The movie ponders upon such things as the life of an immigrant in the US and what it means to be a real patriot of one's country. The film discusses such things as race, Racism, the tense relations between Russians and Ukrainians, Russians and Americans, and so on. Again, exactly like with the first movie, I feel like a lot of ideas and viewpoints in it haven't aged too well in the context of modern Russia, which we will discuss later, but it's still an interesting watch nonetheless. Many people see Brat 1 as the more interesting and profound low-budget masterpiece, and think that Brat 2 essentially is just a more westernized blockbuster movie that shouldn't have ever really been made. I personally disagree with the sentiments, in fact, I love this movie way more than the first one, and it's probably my favorite Russian movie, period. I just really like the entire premise of it. The whole movie is basically the adventures of an absolutely clueless Russian guy in the US who experiences the worst and the best America has to offer. Again, I might be biased since I actually dream of visiting the US myself one day, and even though I do not plan to immigrate, the topic of the struggle of a Russian immigrant or expat in the US hits very close to home for me. This as well basically is the topic of GTA 4, and that game is my favorite in the entire GTA series for that exact same reason. Anyway, regardless of the opinions of people who don't like the movie as much though, it's still regarded as a cult classic in Russia. Brat 2 is just more ambitious and interesting than the first movie for me, and a lot of the things are just better. The soundtrack is actually incredible and gives me mad nostalgia for my childhood in the early 2000s, when my dad used to watch this movie all the damn time. So let's discuss why this movie is so great and why my American weeaboo soul loves it so much. I present to you guys, Russian Movie Review, Brat 2. Spoiler warning contains spoilers for both Brat movies. Now before we start, let's have a little recap of the first movie. The first and the second movie storylines actually don't have that much in common, so we'll go over it very briefly. The main character is Danila Bagrov, a young clueless man who's recently returned from his service in the army. Danila has an older brother named Victor, who lives in St. Petersburg. Danila moves to the big city to reunite with his brother. Victor turns out to be a hitman working for a gang kingpin named Krugli. Long story short, Danila ends up being sucked into the criminal world by his brother, and the two become enemies of Krugli the kingpin, who starts a manhunt against them. Danila eventually kills Krugli and saves his brother, but the woman he loves is disgusted with what he has become and leaves him. That is basically the gist of it. If you want to know more, you can watch my review of the first movie. Brat 2 starts out with Danila appearing on TV with a few of his friends for an interview. 
The movie starts out in Moscow this time, which is made obvious by shots of the Astankina TV tower. The interview Danila participates in is a part of a talk show about the first Chechen war. This right here reveals a major plot point for both movies. In Brat 1 it was implied that Danila did serve in the army and might have been involved in some type of combat, but it was never explicitly mentioned. Danila didn't like talking about it and always told people that he worked in the military headquarters and did paperwork. Brat 2 reveals that Danila did take part in combat. His friends even say that he was the bravest soldier of them all. Along with the interview, we see a few shots of Viktor, Danila's brother, who's watching the show and drinking vodka. Nothing like some brotherly love. Now, let's get the cringiest part of the movie out of the way first. Brat 2, just like the first movie, has a weird sort of product placement-esque appearance of a celebrity that doesn't really fit well to the rest of the movie. In Brat 1, it was the multiple screen appearances of Vyacheslav Butusov, the leader of a Russian band called Nautilus Pampilius. He had a few lines of dialogue in the movie and was sort of an episodic character. It did make some sense in the first movie, however, because the entirety of Brat 1's soundtrack was actually made by Nautilus Pampilius. Brat 2 on the other hand, features a weird cameo from Irina Soltykova, a pop singer mildly popular in Russia in the early 2000s. She ultimately becomes Danila's love interest and some of her songs play in the movie, but it's really just bizarre and doesn't fit the movie at all. The entirety of the movie's plot basically moves on without her. Almost all of her appearances are just her annoying Danila with phone calls when he's doing something worthwhile. It feels like not only the viewer, but the director or Danila himself doesn't even want her to be in this movie. She basically just acts like an entitled brat the whole time and Danila even disses her music to her face. <laughs> Why did she have to be in this movie? I will never know. Anyway, let's return back to the plot. Danila and his friends that fought with him in the Chechen war are hanging out at a sauna, and one of his mates, Konstantin, tells him about a major problem. Konstantin has a twin brother named Dmitri, who just happens to be a professional hockey player in the NHL for the Chicago Blackhawks. And yes, the twin brother is played by the same actor with a wig and a few piercings. Anyways, according to the story, before playing hockey in the US, the twin brother played in Ukraine, and after moving to the NHL, the Ukrainian mafia tried to pressure Dmitri into giving them a cut of his earnings. In order to evade having to pay the Ukrainians, Dmitri signed a contract with an American businessman named Richard Menes who promised to provide them protection. The protection did come, however, it came at a price, because the contract that the American created put Dmitri in a very bad situation in which pretty much all of his money goes to menace, and overall a sum of over 900,000 US dollars is being withheld from the hockey playing brother. Basically, Konstantin's bro is being screwed over financially and has beef not only with the Ukrainian mafia in the US, but also the businessman, who Konstantin describes as the new Al Capone. <laughs> Ah, uh, classic Danila with his great knowledge of Western culture. Konstantin tells Danila that the American businessman has actually just arrived in Moscow and is conveniently having some business with Konstantin's boss. Konstantin decides to tell the boss about the situation and asks him to talk to Manis about it. Richard Manis, who essentially is the main antagonist of the movie, is a quite one-dimensional character. He literally has no other motivation than money and greed, which is, you know, something that never happens in real life, am I right? Anyway, Manis appears in only about like four scenes of the movie and he really has no redeeming qualities about his personality. He's sleazy, scummy and a bit weird. He could easily be replaced by Dr. Evil if I care and nothing would really change. He even has the same mannerisms. His last name is Menace, for God's sake. A bit later in the movie, Konstantin's boss actually describes all of Menace's criminal endeavors. He does all sorts of classic things. Runs a drug trade, owns hotels and bars, finances political campaigns, and also apparently is such a sick fuck that he buys snuff videos of real rapes and murders from Russia. Why does he do that? Why does it have to be from Russia? Do rapes filmed in America just don't do it for him? Who knows? He's just evil for the sake of being an evil American. But to be fair, Russians have been villains in tons of Western media for decades, so I guess it's fine. We can have our own evil American bad guy if we want to. At least once. So, Konstantin's boss tries to talk to Menace about the situation with the hockey playing brother, but Menace doesn't really want to discuss it or do anything about it. Konstantin's boss, led by his own greed, sides with Menace and asks his goons to deal with Konstantin, so that he never brings this up again and stops ruining his business. Danila goes to visit Konstantin in his home and finds him dead. 
In order to avenge his dead friend and fulfill his dying wish, Danilo decides that he needs to help Constantine's brother in the US, get his money back to him and show the evil American where the crayfish spend winter. Sorry, that's a Russian proverb, it means to show someone what for. So that's essentially the entire premise to the movie, and to be completely honest, it's pretty dumb, and in my opinion, kind of irrelevant to the movie itself. It does seem like a real situation that could happen in real life, but I honestly couldn't care less about the characters of Constantine and his twin brother Dmitri. Not only are they played by the same actor, which is kinda cheesy, but also they were never in the original movie, and in general, the viewer's investment in their story is very low. I don't really care for the particular hockey player arc that sets off the story that much. What I truly like about this movie is the deeper topics it covers that are smaller in the context of the storyline. The relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the relationship between Russians and Americans, the juxtaposition of the two countries, the idea of what it truly means to be a patriot of one's country, the hardships of life of immigrants and expats in the US, the discussion of what matters more, truth or money, and of course, the theme of the brotherhood and the relationship between Danila and Viksa, which is a needle threading through both movies. So, before Danila can execute his plan of avenging the dead brother in arms, he needs to get intel on the American and know where to look for him. Danila and his other friend track down Constantine's boss and decide to pay him a visit. But first they need to prepare. There are quite a few funny scenes here and there. For example, Danila buys a gun from some Nazi crossdresser that owns a bunch of World War II era guns. I honestly love the writing in this movie because sometimes it delivers some hilarious dialogue. Russia. Danila. Meanwhile, Victor, Danila's brother, arrives in Moscow and finds him by finding out that Danila's friend works in a war museum right next to the Red Square. Very convenient. We also get some shots of Victor walking around Moscow with some kick-ass music in the background, which is a nice callback to the shots of Danila walking around St. Petersburg in the original film. The two brothers meet again, they talk it out, and Victor decides to help Danila. Now, the fact that Brat 2 is much more of a Hollywood-inspired blockbuster film can be seen pretty easily. For example, in this scene where Danila's war friend straight up hacks a car and steals it born identity style or something. If you guys remember, in my previous review, I praised Brat 1 for how rooted in reality the film was. There was no insane shootouts or Hollywood firework spectacles where Danila was shown as some sort of god and fearless assassin. Well, I can confidently say that Brat 2 throws all the original's authenticity out the window. We get some epic hacking scenes that make no sense, and later in the movie, a few shootouts where Danila takes on like 10 guys and destroys everyone. It's kind of a shame how the original movie's vision is compromised here, but nevertheless, seeing how Russians tried to make a Hollywood blockbuster film is still a fun watch. Danila arrives to the school where Constantine Boss's kid studies and ends up at some sort of school pupil talent show. The boss's kid is reciting a poem and Danila is genuinely touched by it. Danila pretends to be the new teacher at the school and asks the boss for a few words. Anyway, Danila gets all the intel he needs on Menace from the boss and leaves him be, just because he likes his kid. It also turns out that Constantine's boss didn't actually order his goons to kill Constantine, and it was all a misunderstanding. Meanwhile, Danila, his friend, and Victor literally take a World War I-era Maxime machine gun from the war museum the friend works at and decide to find a hideout place. One of the interesting details I noticed in the movie that I've never seen before is that Danila has a USSR passport instead of a Russian one. Keep in mind, the movie is supposed to take place in 1999, well after the fall of the Soviet Union. This this is honestly a really weird detail and I'm not sure what it means. Early in the movie, there's been a scene that implied that Danila is not registered as a resident of Moscow, and a cop scolds him for it. But the case might be that Danila is actually not registered as a citizen of the Russian Federation. Like, he never got his passport because he refused to acknowledge Russia as a real country? Is he one of these people that think that USSR still exists and Russia is not real or something like that? He's just really, really weird, and I honestly could not find any explanation of this online. Anyway, Danila brings the whole gang to the flat owned by Irina, the pop singer I mentioned earlier. The flat is already surrounded and being watched over by Constantine Boss's goons when Daniela and Victor decide to leave, and they make a great escape in a pretty epic chase scene. The chase goes on for a bit, and Daniela thinks there is no way of escaping the goons. Victor, however, decides to bring out the fucking World War One era Maxim gun and destroy everyone with it. This is just so over the top, I love it. Also pretty low budget too, because we don't see any of the explosions or bullets. Danila and Victor kill all the goons with the machine gun and blow up their own car with a grenade, after which they... simply walk it off. I guess all of that didn't alert the police or anything. 
Very rooted in reality of you, Bratu. Danila's friend finally gets Danila and Victor foreign passports and American visas. The brothers are supposed to go to Chicago. The plan is for Victor to fly to Chicago, while Danila is supposed to take a flight to New York, rent a car there and drive to Chicago to avoid suspicion. While the brothers take their flights, Konstantin's boss employs the Ukrainian mafia in Chicago to find Danila. This is pretty much where my favorite part of the movie begins. There is nothing funnier and more interesting than the adventures of these two absolutely clueless Russian guys in America. Konstantin's boss finds out about the fact that both the brothers have just arrived to the US and also asks the Ukrainian mafia to be on the lookout for Victor. Meanwhile, Danila arrives to New York and we get to hear one of the most iconic monologues of the entire movie, delivered by an angry taxi driver. And now your family has lost two wars in Crim. The Russian people in the Prebaltic, the Serbs in the Balkans, the Russian people. Today the Russian people are there, where the back is in the air. And you better know me. That's why we came here. I really, really like the spots. I've seen a lot of people online make the claim that Bratsu is essentially pro-Russian propaganda that paints Russians as the force of truth and good in this world, while the Americans with their greed are the embodiment of evil, and yes, it's partly true. And if you guys remember, the character of Danila had a very anti-American stance even in Brat 1, and Brat 2 goes even further. However, this scene shows that the writing is also pretty well aware of the shortcomings of the Russian foreign policy and the so-called idea of the Russian world. It's not much, but it definitely makes this movie not as biased or one-sided as people paint it to be. Danila arrives at Brighton Beach, the famous so-called Little Russia district of New York famous for its largely Russian population and a ton of local businesses such as shops and restaurants whose signs are fully in Russian. The scene in which Danilo walks around the streets of Brighton Beach and explores the district honestly just hits different. Not only do I love this scene because of how much it reminds me of GTA 4 and the in-game district of Hove Beach, which is pretty much a direct copy of Brighton Beach, but because of how great the shots work together with music. I honestly feel like the music used in this movie gets overlooked a ton, particularly in the context of how well it fits to what's happening on screen. In the Brighton Beach scene, we hear a song called Iskala by the Russian artist Zinfira. Not only is the song amazing and hits for me for nostalgic reasons, but the lyrics fit the scene so well. As the camera pans around the streets of New York and the countless shop signs, as well as during some shots of Danila driving on an American highway, we hear these lyrics. You just like the dream, you just like the pictures I painted of you in my albums. The song is originally about a love interest, but it clearly gets a different meaning here. It's about America. Even though a lot of Russians might claim they don't like the US too much, deep down, a lot of them would probably love to visit. After all, ever since the 1980s, the Russians have been consuming American media, idolizing American TV and movie stars, looking at American cars and skyscrapers on pictures and video, and to a lot of Russians, and even to me still, since I've never actually visited, the US feels like a completely different universe. It's like an alien planet, where everything is so different and where most of Russians probably would never even set their foot in. America is nothing more than a concept, a dream. And considering the fact that according to the statistics, over 70% of adults in Russia have never been abroad, it is a dream. This is precisely why I think the lyrics that say you're just like the dream fit perfectly. And the choice of music was very deliberate. It's also the same for many other songs in the soundtrack as well. For example, the song Vichna Maldoy by the band Smyslovy Galitsky. Nazi, which is definitely my favorite piece of soundtrack in this movie. The lyrics go as follows. I could have drank an entire sea, I could have become different. Always young, always drunk. These lyrics echo really well with the theme of the criminal lifestyle and the regrets that come along with it. The thoughts of how life could have been different. Anyway, let's get back to the story because I could go on forever about this. Danila goes to rent a car to go to Chicago, and the guy that's renting him the car is the most stereotypical Russian Jew of all time. He promises Danila that the car is really good and worth the money, and would not only drive him to Chicago, but all the way to San Francisco and back. He then hits him with the following following line, which has become iconic. The joke here is that, of course, the car breaks on the way, and the lying Jew lied about the car being good. This right here uh, didn't really age too well in my opinion. The implication here is that the Jewish man, who by the way speaks the most cartoonish Jewish Russian accent ever, almost sounded like a caricature, lied to Danila about being Russian. And I guess if he was a real Russian, then he wouldn't exploit Danila like this and essentially scam him? 
Well, it doesn't hold up that well, considering the fact that the entire Russian criminal underground is based on people basically exploiting and using each other, and all of these criminal guys are Russian, by the way. And also considering the fact that Russia right now is one of the most corrupt countries in the world that embezzles and exploits its own people, and is fully ran by Russians. I guess this scene is just a product of Russian anti-Semitism, which there's a lot of in Russia, actually. Very often, people love to blame all of their misfortunes on the Jews. I've heard stuff like this even in my family, things along the lines of Oh, everything would be fine if that Jew Lenin didn't come along and ruin everything. Even though Lenin being poo-poo doesn't really have to do with him being Jewish, he's just poo-poo. So is the movie blaming the Jews for why Russia is so messed up and why people lie to each other? Or is it actually smart commentary on how Russians blame the Jews for all of their misfortunes, meanwhile cunning and tricking their fellow Russians, acting exactly like the bullshit anti-Semitic lying Jew stereotype themselves? I honestly don't know, and even though this scene is pretty funny, it does get a yikes from me. Meanwhile, when all of this is going down, Victor is walking around the Ukrainian hoods of Chicago, where he gets into a little argument with an American Ukrainian cop, who wants to bust them for drinking in public. Ah, those damn Ukrainians with their loss. In true Russian fashion, Victor beats up the cop, steals his money and his gun. So Danila is driving to the American countryside and his car breaks down. Now since Danila's car is broken and he cannot drive anymore, he hitchhikes a truck and sets on his way to Chicago. The truck is driven by an average Midwestern dude named Ben Johnson, with whom Danila forms a pretty wholesome bond, despite barely knowing any English at all. From? I, me? I, I'm an American. I'm American. I'm in America. I'm America. Where are you from? Ah, I'm Russian. Russian? Uh -huh. From Moscow? Moscow. <laughs> Russia is very big. Very big. I, I'm Ben. Ben uh, Johnson. I'm from Chicago, Johnson. Illinois. Из Чикаго, Illinois. Данила Багров, from Moscow. Uh, what do you do? Чем ты занимаешься? Do I, I me? I'm a, a truck driver. I, Я водитель. I drive a truck. Я вожу грузовик. А ты? You. Студент. Медицинский институт. Oh, oh, a student! I really, really love this little arc of Danila and Ben's drive to Chicago. It's just really funny to see Danila, this tough guy, act like a literal child who's excited when seeing a new place for the first time, looking at everything and eating burger. Moreover than that, it's a pretty wholesome scene that shows that friendship between Americans and Russians is possible. The story of how this scene was shot is also pretty funny. The crew couldn't find a truck or afford to buy one, and so the truck used in the scene actually actually belonged to a random driver that was hitchhiked by the crew. The driver was actually going to Detroit and had about 4 hours of free time, in which the crew managed to film all the scenes which required the truck. So, Danila and Ben finally arrive to Chicago, and by chance Danila meets a Russian prostitute named Dasha, who he will later cross paths again with. Afterwards, we get a bunch of shots of Danila essentially trying to find a place to spend the night in Chicago, since his credit cards end up being overdrawn. Danila spends a freezing cold night outside, while Victor so he's not doing so bad. He's on a Chicago tour bus, drinking booze with a bunch of hoes. What a pimp. Anyway, Danila, being the bright young man that he is, finds a place to spend the night. He deliberately jumps in front of traffic, ending up being ran over by a local news TV host named Lisa Jeffrey. Not only does she take him into her house and lets him spend some time there, but Danila also ends up smashing when she comes home from work. What an absolute legend. So, things are looking pretty good for Danila, right? But he cannot just be calm for one fucking second because he's a Russian Chad fighting for justice. This is why Danila decides to pay a visit to the hoods to get the Russian hooker named Dasha, who he met earlier, in order to try to get her out of there and give her a better life. So Danila arrives to actual Chicago hoods. All of these scenes were actually filmed in actual, authentic hoods of Chicago. Upon watching this scene, it feels so authentic that for a second I was actually wondering whether the people in this scene are even actors or not. It feels like they just dropped off somewhere and Danila is genuinely just getting bullied by a bunch of random black guys. Danila walks into the first bar he sees and asks to see the Russian prostitute. The bartender calls in the pimp and his goons, and they lead Danila to Dasha. It's honestly so funny because even such a badass as Danila seems to be scared shitless of real hood dudes. The story of how this was shot is actually really funny too, because one of the actors in the scene has actually watched the original Brat movie and told all his friends about it, and overall the interviews with the black actors that took part of the movie are pretty funny. Danila tries to beat up the pimp and his goons and 
and take Dasha, but gets his shit handed to him. Apparently, in this scene, the actors were actually beating the fuck out of Sergei Badrov, because that's what the director asked them to do. And apparently, Sergei actually had two of his ribs broken in the scene. Now that's what I call method acting. Then he lines up in the police station and explains what happens. The very racist cop lets him go. Them, That's American police for you, pretty accurate I would say. Danilo finally meets with Dmitri, Konstantin's hockey playing brother, and gets Menace's office address from him. We then get a Breaking Bad-esque scene of Danilo building something, just like in the first movie. This time it's a self-made pistol, known in Russia as Samastril. According to the director, approving it and making it was a huge hassle for the crew, as the Americans looked at it as a health hazard. Those stupid poopoo -poo Americans, am I right? Now, meanwhile, Danilo actually tries to do something to help and is planning his attack on Menace, Victor is literally just hanging out with women at the bar and making it rain. Man, this guy is really just like Roman Bellic from GTA. For. He does almost absolutely fucking nothing worthwhile in the entire movie. As Victor is hanging out at the bar, he's noticed by one of the Ukrainian mobsters, and they end up having a little showdown in the toilet of the bar. As Victor shoots the Ukrainian, he says the classic line. <laughs> I've already discussed this particular line in detail in the review of the previous movie, but I'll repeat myself. The movie definitely has a pro-Russian, even nationalist stance. This line is an obvious reference to the fact that Crimea used to be a part of Russia within the USSR, and was part of Ukraine in the time of filming of this movie. Now, of course, as Russia has taken control over Crimea, this line is often celebrated and is called prophetic. Just like I said in the previous video, I literally do not care at all for the so-called idea of the Russian world, neither do I like Russian Russian imperialism or nationalism, so I personally find this line pretty cringe. The creators of the movie definitely have politics that are very different to mine, but that is completely fine, and I do not let it influence my enjoyments of both Brat movies. Danila meets with Dasha again and asks if she can help him to get a gun. Dasha organizes a meeting with a bunch of gangsters, who are supposed to sell Danila an Uzi for $2000. However, instead of buying the gun, Danilo uses the self-made pistol that he made earlier to shoot one of the goons, scare off the others, and basically get everything for free. Danilo and Dasha become a team. The pimp and his goons come to kill them, and it's such a funny scene. <laughs> Danilo is basically reciting the poem that he heard the kid reciting at the start of the movie, while a bunch of black guys are storming into the building and screaming and cursing him, with the most monotone female voice translating everything into Russian. I don't know about you, but it's comedy goal to me. Anyway, Danilo just kills them all because in this movie he's basically fucking Terminator. Dasha and Danilo successfully escape and finally get to meet Victor. Finally, it's it, like the entire movie has been leading up to this at this point. Victor comes in a bit late, looking like an absolute clown. I don't know what that look is about, honestly, with you guys. But the group finds out that they literally have no money to buy any food, and they decide to just... to do something in old Russian fashion. Just catch a bunch of crayfish from the Lake Michigan. The group are boiling crayfish that they just got from Lake Michigan, and a black hobo comes over to see what they're doing. Danila tells them to fuck off and calls them Nyeger, which is basically the Russian word for African American. It's actually not considered that politically correct anymore in Russia, but it used to be a literal word that basically just meant black person. It's not a racist word inherently. It has a different connotation to the actual N word, basically. It's it's a bit different. The black guy gets offended because he thinks that Danila called him the N word. And then the group has a little debate about whether it's politically correct to say the N word or not. But I don't really think I can put that on YouTube, to be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, this one, this one is kind of a problem too. <laughs> so sometime later, Victor basically bails on Danila and just disappears, not coming to the meeting they were supposed to have. Danila gets info that Menace is supposed to be at some club. Danila comes in and we get a cool action scene, shot entirely from a first-person perspective. This is actually pretty cool cinematography and pretty inventive, especially for a Russian movie in the year 2000s. Anyway, it turns out that Menace is in present and is actually in his office. Danila climbs the skyscraper stairs and arrives to Menace's office, killing everyone on his way. Upon seeing Menace, he does the most Russian thing ever, has a vodka shot with him and delivers a very iconic quote, discussing the nature of power and what it really means to be powerful. Я вот думаю, что сила в правде. 
У кого правда, тот и сильней. Менес gives our hero the hockey money, and Danila finally gives it to Dmitry. Danila gives away all of it. He wants no part or cut of it. To Danila, money is irrelevant, because the truth is what matters more. Danila has fulfilled his friend's dying wish, and his mission here is done. Victor ends up being surrounded and busted in his apartment for assaulting the police officer early in the movie. His fate afterwards is unknown, but as he's getting busted, he screams that he's surrendering and wants to live here. It's implied that even though both the brothers went through so much, Victor has not changed at all. Unlike Danila, who's learned his lesson, he's still possessed with greed and dreams of money and power. Danila and Dasha swing by Lisa's apartment. Are you all gangsters? gangsters? No, we are Russians. No, we They ask Ben, the truck driver from earlier, for help, get disguised, and arrive at the airport. Danila pays Ben for his work and for his help with a cassette full of Russian music. This implies that Ben is just like Danila. He's selfless and does not care much about money. Dasha and Danila finally get on the plane back to Russia and scare the steward boy into bringing them vodka. Danila calls Irina and tells her he's coming back. He puts in his headphones and looks outside as the plane takes off. The legendary song Goodbye America by Nautilus Pompilio starts playing and... Credits. And that pretty much wraps it up for Brad 2, another Russian movie that has become a cult classic. I love this film for a particular reason. I don't think I've ever seen any other Russian movie like this. Of course, there have been other Russian films shot in America, sure, but none of them were ever as good and portrayed it as authentically as Brad does. And even though the first movie is much more authentic and rooted in reality, with the first half of Brad 2 with all the hacking and stuff being way too over the top in my opinion, the second half of the film taking place in America is really some of the best kino that's ever been made in Russia. Combine all of that with great acting, a stellar soundtrack full of Russian bangers from the 2000s, and some truly great underlying ideas, this movie is definitely one of the best Russian films I've seen. It is still massively popular to this day and has become the most popular piece of the legacy left behind by the incredible late actor Sergei Badrov and the director Alexei Balabanov, who has even more great movies that have some really deep and disturbing subject matter revolving around modern Russia. You guys need to keep in mind that the way I portrayed the movie in this review is very much concise. A lot of the deeper meaning in subject matter is lost, because covering and discussing it all would literally make this video longer than the actual movie. If you truly want to feel the atmosphere of what Russia was like on the verge of the millennium, put yourself in the shoes of an expat or an immigrant in the US, as well as get a better understanding of the struggle in the relationship between Russians, Americans and Ukrainians, then I definitely recommend you to see this movie. You will not regret it. So yeah guys, that is pretty much going to do it for this movie review of Brad Su, the epic Russian movie. Um, this is only my second movie review that I'm making now, so I'm still pretty new to this, and I'm aware of the criticism a lot of people said that uh, my videos are more... It's more like a summary with some commentary than a review, so honestly, I will be looking into that. I might switch up the formula for the next movie review I'm going to do, but I still think it's really interesting to go over the story of the movie and explore some ideas and discuss them, so if you guys did enjoy this video, if you guys want more Russian content if you guys want me to make more movie reviews in the future perhaps make sure to please smash the like on this video and subscribe and tell your friends and as well guys if you want to support my channel i would, I would gladly appreciate if you guys would donate to my patreon the link is down in the description you guys do not understand how much it helps me out and yeah that is pretty much it for today's movie review and i'll see you guys in the next one peace